On today's show, the Dallas Mavericks seem to be built to beat the Clippers now. We'll talk about how they're different and ask all kinds of questions about the Dallas Mavericks. I'm joined by Darian Vizier of Locked On Clippers. Talk about all about Mavs vs. Clippers on today's Locked On Mavs. I'm Luka Doncic and this is Locked On Mavericks. Welcome to the Mavericks. NBA champion. He is back. He is back. He is back. It's good. And the Mavericks have won the game. If you don't believe, you shouldn't be here. Loyalty never fades away. And welcome. You are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Engstead, media member and NBA channel manager for the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for being part of the show, making Locked On Mavs your first listen today, or maybe your second, multiple episodes all the time, flying into your feeds. The best way you can help us grow the show is to listen to that show every day on any podcast platform. Leave a five-star review there, like the video, and comment anything below in this video, and then go to Locked On Clippers. And just comment this. Well, we have a title. That's it. Well, we have a title. Go comment Locked On Clippers that. Let's see how many we can get in a row. Well, we have a title. That's it. Just, just do that. Uh, Darren Baziri joins me today of Locked On Clippers. We had a great time. We did two episodes. So this one, and there'll be one tomorrow as well. Where we'll talk about the Clippers side of things. We'll talk mostly about Mavs side of things on this. But we get a lot of Clippers talk in as well. So you're going to learn a ton in this episode. I love how it, it turned out. I love how we uh, got into a ton of different things. And then we ended the show go, man, we forgot about this, forgot about this, forgot about this. There's so many things we can talk about in this series. But let's talk. Let's start right now. Here's my conversation with Lockdown Clippers host, Darian Baziri. Here we are. The first crossover ever of my time being locked on Clippers host. And it's funny because I talk to Nick the most, but Nick Angstead of Locked <laughs> on Mavs. Here we go. Round three. Let's go. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for round three of this? I'm extremely ready. Are you ready? Are you ready for one more time? Maybe not once more. Maybe that's not the last time, but you'll have to deal with. <laughs> Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that again in the playoffs? Absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not. So uh, that, that's, the, that's the biggest thing. Can we beat Luka Doncic three times? Can the Clippers do this three times? And it's a very different Four. side of uh, both teams, different version of both teams. Yeah, it absolutely is. These, these are very different teams that, that we're seeing now, uh, the Mavericks especially. The Mavericks are a different team right now than they were – like in January, this team is completely different. This team used to be a team that just relied on the three, a team that, you know, live and die by the three. Jason Kidd would say that over and over again. And then in pressers, he would say, look, we're a team that you, we've got to score 130 points if the other team, because the other team's going to score 120 or 125 every time. We saw it when one of the Clippers Mavs games was like 140 to 120 this season. And now this Mavericks team is completely different. They've added some defense. They've, they've, you know, like added some size for sure. The Gafford lively pairing is great. Putting Maxi back into the role where he can be a five if he needs to. He can play next to a, a you know a different five, and so you don't have to rely on him to be that guy. That's been a real luxury for them. PJ Washington has been an amazing addition. His defense has been better than even I expected for the Mavericks, and so th this team is completely different. And they're different from twenty and twenty one. The last time these two teams faced in the playoffs. Because of Kyrie. Like, do you remember who the second leading scorer was in those series? It was Tim Hardaway Jr. <laughs> like, it was Tim Hardaway Jr. One game, it was Trey Burke. He scored 25 points in a game four in 2020. Like, th this Mavericks team has not had this second guy. Jalen Brunson was not this guy back when these two teams played before. And I'm fascinated to see how Kyrie fits into the, the the second guy next to Luka, the release valve next to Luka, because all the pressure is going to go on, on Luka, and then all of a sudden – got Kyrie and these guys can score one-on-one -on -one and they've got every option in front of him. And I'm fascinated to see how, how those two work together in the playoffs because we did not get to see it last year. And that was, that was terrible. Yeah. That's obviously the fear from Clipper fans end is that Luka Doncic took us to seven games with not having a reliable number two. Obviously there was the whole, you know, controversy with Porzingis and how he was being used and him not being happy with that eventually led to the trade but <laughs> the con the controversy by the way was from Porzingis <laughs> was right it was from no one else he had become that player just they stuck him in the corner and that's the way he'd played all season yeah but now you have a bona fide not just a, a great number two option but someone who has won the championship as a number two option obviously people that are skeptical of Kyrie Irving will say that was eight years ago and I, I'm guessing we'll talk about Kyrie and, and his question marks going into the playoffs because 
There are some from other people. I don't know about Mavs fans. Their confidence level in Kyrie is probably higher. But there are, especially on the Clippers side, I've heard so many Clipper fans say, well, Kyrie Irving, like, what, what's he done in the playoffs recently since LeBron? And you know you know, people have said that, and I know Kyrie's sure. aware of that as well. The, the thing with the Clippers that's made them so different, obviously, than 2021 is you mentioned Dallas having a second guy now. Well, now the Clippers have a third guy. And, and Reggie Jackson, right. for what it's worth, I, I made sure to – I had to troll the Mavs fans just a little bit <laughs> with <this> Reggie Jackson. <laughs> you're either but, trolling the Mavs or you're trolling the current Nuggets right now. <laughs> either, either way. Right. You're trolling. The, Reggie Jackson, though, I would always make jokes, funny enough, that he kind of transformed into like a discount Kyrie for us with the shots he was making <laughs> and the insane things he was doing in that 2021 playoff run. But now we have James Harden, who – in the third option role, the only time we've seen him since OKC was Brooklyn. And there's a lot of people that believe that had their Kyrie Irving and James Harden not been injured, that they would have won the championship or beaten Milwaukee. So James Harden is now in what people believe is the best role for him to win a championship. And there's been definitely two versions of James Harden this year, which is, I think, what this series is really going to come down to, besides, of course, the obvious Kawhi Leonard's health. But that's the main difference between the Clippers for me is we don't have as many wings. We just have a lot of wings. Nicholas Batum, Marcus Morris. I'm trying to think if we're missing anyone else in that 2021, but it was, it was mainly Marcus Morris and Nicholas Batum. And then we had Terrence Mann come in and Pat Bev gave some minutes here and there. But 2021, you, the Mavericks played Pat Bev kind of off the floor. He wasn't yeah. really that used. He was coming off an injury. So it was that's, like immediate. <laughs> it was like with, within the first couple of minutes of the first game, we're like, oh God, he can't play in the series. Well, well, I vividly remember the second game I was at. Luca took Pat Bev right to the basket and gone and one. And I was like, "Yeah, we can't switch Pat Bev onto Luca anymore." And he didn't become a bigger, he didn't become a big impact piece for the Clippers that playoff run till the second and, and second round in the conference finals. But that my my main difference is the Clippers were more of a wing heavy roster before, and now we don't have those wings. We don't have the same defensive personnel, but we do have James Harden, which has made us one of the better offensive teams in the league. Yeah, I said on my show the other day, the two swing players of the series are Harden and, Ky and Kyrie. I think we know what we're getting from Luka. We know what we're getting from Paul George. And if Kawhi plays, which I'm assuming he plays, I'm assuming, I'm just going to assume that Kawhi is going to come in and be completely fine in game one. Like that's, that's what I'm assuming, even though there is concerns and all this. And by the time you listen to this, you may know more, but I'm assuming he's going to play. But I think Harden and Kyrie are the two swing players because, yeah, I, I think there has been some question about Kyrie. Um, you know, all the risks and stuff that, that they took when they they made the trade, like none of those have come to fruition at all in, in any way. But now you look at, okay, we can just focus on basketball. You don't have to focus on any of the off-the-court stuff anymore. And there's kind of some question about, all right, well, how are they going to – how are Luka and Kyrie going to defend in the playoffs when it comes down to it when one of those guys is going to have to defend – one of the three on the Clippers, right? I mean, you got Derek Jones and you got PJ Washington. And then is it Kyrie taking Harden? Is it Luka taking Harden? I mean, defense in the NBA is no longer just this like one-on-one. -on -one. You got to guard the person in front of you. Everybody's going to be moving around and all that. So Luka and Kyrie will guard everybody at some point with all the switches and stuff. But yeah, the, the question is going to be, how can you know a smaller guard like Kyrie hold up in that anymore in the NBA? And he was okay for the the I thought he was okay for like a star player with Boston and with Brooklyn but you go back to how he played with the clip with the the Cavs back with LeBron and I think setting him next to a guy that's that playmaker that controls that much attention he did not have that in Boston and Katie's just not that same type of player that Luka and LeBron are like they're they're just more of the playmakers uh, first grade as KD is and so I think that that Kyrie is is also like for the same thing that Harden is like in his in his best spot right now. I think Kyrie is in his best spot right now too because he can float in and out of the game. He doesn't have to control it at any point. And then all of a sudden, when the Mavs need something, he can turn it on no matter what. And that's what Brunson had really figured out by the end is I have to be able to turn it on immediately and then go get a bucket and go get this. And Kyrie is one of the best in the NBA. Just go get me a bucket, right? Like he made a career out of going and getting a bucket with a fake beard and you know and wrinkles on, on. <laughs> and so he uh he did that and made a movie and then he then he uh in the nba he's been am amazing at that and so i'm fascinated at those two players i think they're the real swing players of this of this series and whoever i don't know if it, do you think it's whoever has the best series between harden and Kyrie wins the series not quite actually I i'm very much pro that kind of stuff when it comes to the best players although with this series as you said luca and Kawhi are just Fairly, re fairly reliable in the playoffs, to put it lightly. 
Uh, so you know what you're probably going to get from them. I actually, and the Clipper fans might not like this, but I have more faith in Kyrie Irving in his role than, than James Harden performing in his. And it's only mm. because I saw Kyrie Irving do it at the highest level. And I personally don't think he's gotten much worse as a player at all. Whereas James Harden, he's, not. he's coming off a, a major hamstring injury that has significantly, because if people remember James Harden in 2021, he was literally an MVP candidate. Kyrie and KD, especially KD, missed a lot of games. Remember Brooklyn had only played like 14 games or something with the big three. So Harden actually really shouldered that load for Brooklyn that whole season and was, I believe, third in the MVP race after Steph Curry and Jokic. Um, or Embiid and Jokic. I remember that was the year for Jokic's first MVP. But I remember Harden was in the mix, and he's not quite that same guy. And of course, there are a lot of postseason question marks around both. But James Harden does get the he's never won a ring kind of skepticism. And to be honest, James Harden, he has picked it up or over the last two three weeks. But he had a stretch in March and the beginning of April, and he was not looking the same as. December and January. And I know you're going to end up asking about what the biggest change was. And that was the biggest change is James Harden's yeah. offensive production. Whereas Kyrie Irving, he looks pretty good. I've been, I've been watching some of the games. He looks pretty good. He made that amazing game winner against Denver. I huge. think he's been defending better all season than I've seen him yep. in the past. And he had some huge scoring games towards the end of the season. So I think this, I agree with everything you're saying. This is the most functional situation that Kyrie Irving has been in since probably the 2017-18 Celtic season when he was actually going well before he got hurt. And as you said, he's not really the point guard now like he was for Boston. I think when you saw him play with Brooklyn, he was kind of the second scorer after KD, but he touched the ball the third most. But you saw that Kyrie's role, he wants to get buckets. Like he's not a he's he's an underrated passer in my opinion, but he's a score first kind of guy. He has a score first, attack first mentality. And when you put him next to a guy like LeBron or Luka, I think that's ideally the best role for him. So that's why I'm a little more confident in Kyrie. But overall, no, I don't think it's going to come down to us a better series between those two. But I will say this. If the Clippers win, whether Kawhi plays or not, they're going to need a good James Harden. I, I don't believe that they can win with James Harden playing badly. And that doesn't necessarily mm. mean scoring a lot, but he's got to be creating offensively. And as you said, Derek Jones and P.J. Washington will start off on Kawhi and Paul George most likely as the primary defenders. And there is going to be switching. But if you're the Clippers and Kyrie Irving's guarding Ky uh, James Harden, Forget the switch. Let's put Gafford in the pick and roll and learn James Harden, Zubat's pick and roll bread and butter and see if Kyrie can guard at the point of attack. I think that's absolutely something we're going to see a lot of. If Zubat's is still is still there. Oh, is that the conversation <laughs> we're having next? <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's get to it. Coming up, let's hear more about how this Mavericks team is different than they were in the past, how they're built to be the Clippers a little bit better. Coming up next. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the type of driver that likes to take things a little bit further? You're like you're like in playoff mode all the time. You wonder what an adventure could be like around the corner. Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to that next level that you want to go to. So check out the 2024 Nissan Rogue. It's perfect for city drives, great escapes. Class exclusive Google built in is your always updating assistant on call for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. They've got that Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store. They're built right into that 12.3 inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is the perfect mid sized crossover for your next adventure. Also, check out their 2024 Nissan Pathfinder. Room for up to eight, expansive cargo capacity, available, advanced 4x4 capability. 284 horsepower, 6,000 pounds of towing. When adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and find your next big adventure. Go to shopnissanusa.com. Again, it's nissanusa.com. Also brought to you by Monopoly Go. We've all been there. You're a player, you're a fan. It's halftime. Scoreboard's not looking so good for you. You're feeling down. You're feeling like, man, it's 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 not looking good for my team. That's when you dig deep. You lift your head up and you say to yourself, "Time to get back in the game. Pull off some bank heists." That's what I always say. Take much, take as much money, my friends. Take as much of my friends' money as possible. Go check out Monopoly Go. It's a fun mobile game where 150 million people have downloaded it. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists and things like leaderboards. You can compare your progress with your friends. Or you can play on your own as well. There's so much to do. Play on countless different boards. You can make your friends go bankrupt by smashing their landmarks. The wrecking ball. There's all kinds of things that you can do in it. You can work with your friends as well to crack open community chests and tournaments. Get rewards. All kinds of stuff. Check out Monopoly Go free on the App Store 
or Google Play. Again, go to Monopoly. Go on the Apple Play, the Apple Store, or the Google Play Store. If it's a Zubats, is he's basically anchored our defense this entire season. I think he's one of the better drop defenders in the league. But of course, if you recall, he hasn't had much success against the Mavericks and Luka. But I will say this. I don't think this series comes down to, like, from some Mavericks fans that are very confident are saying, well, we took the Clippers to seven games without a co-star, so yeah. now we're for sure going to beat them. And I think that's only looking at it from the Mavericks lens, whereas the Clippers, not everything was set in stone, and, and we were the best versions of ourselves in those first two games. Ty Lu had an amazing first regular season as our coach. And then the playoffs started, and he was making really weird decisions. Like, Zubat's just switching on to Luka for two games. And I want to say the first quarter of the third game when – you remember Dallas was killing us, 32-13 or something oh, in the first quarter. Oh, do I remember. They should have gone yeah. up 3-0 after that. Oh, Zoo was just being allowed to switch on to Luka over and over because, of course – they are afraid that in drop coverage, you know, Luca's getting downhill and now you have problems. The point is you have problems either way with Luca, you know, no matter what. So I don't see, because we haven't done it all season, Ty Lu starting with Zoo switching on to Luca. The only reason he tries that is because he believes that Luca's not super quick and he can somewhat be a big body that deters him, but Luca's just so good with the handle. He creates the space for that step back three. And weirdly, you think, you know, Zoo's getting a contest in there. He's still putting a hand up. But that shot, I don't think Luca even sees the contest half the time with that step back. It's really just a matter of if it goes in, it goes in. And Zoo's not really putting pressure on the ball to make him, you know, rush his movement or anything like that. So if we switch Zoo on a Luca, it's going to be absolute problems. But I expect Ty Lue to go with what we've seen all season, which is Zubat's in drop coverage. And that's the thing. If we get exposed there, it's a real conversation. Is Zoo going to be not, you know, utilized a lot? Because I mean, I'm telling you, yeah. If, you, if you're going to play in drop coverage against Luka and against Kyrie, like you're going to get exposed there. I mean, ju you just can't, you, I don't think you can do that in general. And so like, I, I, I agree that Zubats has been very good defensively in drop coverage and all that this season. And I, he, his success has been a lot of the Clippers success. And, you know, he's career high in scoring and that pick and roll with him and Harden, I think has been, a big difference to why this Clippers offense is so much better than it's been in the past. But I don't know if you can just, I don't know if you can even play drop against Luca and Kyrie. Like they, they, they're just too good at the, the pull-up shots and then the, you know, yeah. anything in the pick and roll. And they've got, they've got actual screeners. Now it's not Dwight Powell anymore. You know, it's, it's Gafford and lively and uh man. And, and anybody, and honestly, anybody that that's the one thing about this Mavs offense is that they can call up anybody. Hey, we want to we want to go against Terrence Mann. Hey, we want to go against Zubats. Hey, we want to do this. Like, call up anybody. PJ, Derek Jones Jr., Kyrie, come screen for Luca. Like, it could be any single player that come up and screen for Luca, and they're gonna make something happen. Yeah, especially Kyrie Irving coming off screens for like pull up mid ranges. That's what he does. So, I think one thing I want to say to both sets of fans is the regular season matchups between these two teams. You can throw those completely out the window. I mean, that was that was not the same Dallas Maverick team. So, I think. Yeah, that those matchups mean absolutely nothing. And especially, you know, also the first one where the Mavericks destroyed, as you mentioned, the score it was 144 to 126, if I'm not mistaken. The Brian <laughs> Demer that was the Brian Demaris game. The start of the series. Start of the series. You're the and, problem, James Harden. I mean, that, that look guy, in the mirror. That guy's face is gonna be all over this oh, social media this series. If, it's gonna be crazy. If the if James Harden and I, I hope that it's like Mavs win in five and they get one, they get one game where James Harden hits a <laughs> hits a game winner or something, and Harden comes up to the mic and goes, "Who's the problem now?" Like how how funny would that and we be? We lose in five, and we lose in five though. No, I'm just saying, like in the middle of the series, like I'm, I'm just saying, I, I kind of hope that that happens. That if the Mavs lose one of the games of the series, that it's James Harden that hits a game winner, and he comes up and does that. That'd be so funny. That would be funny, but that game, what I was saying was you can't really take anything from it because that's before Russell Westbrook was even put on the bench. And I haven't even mentioned his name yet, but yeah, th the thing about Russ is when you give him extended minutes to really put his imprint on the game, of course, we've seen that it can go really badly at times, but when it goes well, that guy can affect the game in so many ways. And that grittiness, that toughness, 
is huge for playoff basketball. As much as people want to give Russell Westbrook a hard time for some of his playoff struggles, we also have seen him have amazing playoff games over the years. Yep. And one of them was an example of last year, or an example was one of them last year against the Suns when we still had Kawhi playing. He went three for 19 in the game and still made huge plays defensively, had that block against Devin Booker and knocked it off his leg and made big free throws, got huge offensive rebounds. So, you know, with James Harden, all of the stuff that he does well is going to be, you know, on the ball, creation, shot making. But Westbrook, he gives you those intangibles, those hustle plays. And what I'm really interested, though, is how much Ty Lue's going to use him because that's been a point of controversy all season long is the usage of Westbrook, the leash. He was good against Luka, like defending Luka at, in one yeah. of the matchups this season, too. And that was something that I found really fascinating because he's kind of turned into this six-man energy hustle guy. And if you're playing Westbrook, like how many minutes is he playing this season? If you're playing Westbrook, not 40 minutes a night, you know, like then all of a sudden you're 25. It's I don't even know. 22, 22 yeah. and a half minutes again. Like this, if they pack all of his minutes into that small amount of time, like that's, he can put forth that much more energy. And the Mavericks do the same thing with like a Daniel Gafford. He hasn't played more than like 20, 25 minutes a night normally when. You know, and the, you'd think that the Mavericks would try and just stretch that as, as long as possible, but they've really tried to conserve him because they want that energy, they want that hustle, and so I think those those are like the two main hustle guys for, the, for both teams. I think is Westbrook and then Gafford, and uh, do they stretch any of their minutes? Does it does it deteriorate some of their like hustle and athleticism and force and all that they play with? You know, I'm fascinated with that. And then so Gafford is kind of that guy for the Mavericks. I think that has become that that like hustle force guy. You know, the, you talk about the, the bundled up energy, though, of Russ in that time. One time, sometimes it can have the negative effect where, you know, Russell Westbrook is a guy, he's an emotional player. He only knows he's getting 15 minutes. So in those 15, <laughs> he's just going so hard, looking to just yeah. fourth shots. And it can be a disaster sometimes. It can really be a disaster. I think what makes him so much more comfortable, and you saw this against the Suns last week, when he's knows he's getting time, and especially when he's surrounded by a Paul George or Kawhi to start games, he becomes more of that facilitator. And I, I really love that version of him because he still has the passing chops, but he does not have the same scoring chops he once had. So mm -hmm. that's that's something with Russ to watch. Going back to Zubots, though, I want to mention part of the reason the Clippers slumped so hard, too, in March and in the beginning of April was Zubots got injured. And mm -hmm. our backup. So if, if the Mavericks successfully play Zubots off the floor this time, it's not looking as good as last time at all. I think the Clippers need Zubats to actually be big in this series or good in this series, or they're not going to win because our small, we don't have a, a small ball lineup that's played over 35 minutes together. Like a five man unit has yeah. not played over 35 minutes together. The best Clippers unit by net rating this season is the James Harden, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, Zubats, the four starters, but instead of Terrence Mann, Norman Powell, because Norman Powell, he's actually been our second most consistent. I can't believe I mentioned that when you asked what's different. He is awesome. Norman Powell has been the second most consistent player, not even score, most consistent player this season for the Clippers after Kawhi. And I have a feeling Dallas fans are going to despise him by the end yeah. of this series, no matter how it goes. He's just so efficient. The, like, the difference between Norman Powell and Tim Hardaway Jr. on paper shouldn't be that much, but it, it really is. Like It's a real yeah. big difference in the way that they can get shots and that. And I think that can be a big difference, too. I got asked on a, a different, like non locked on podcast recently, is Tim Hardaway Jr. the X factor in a pot potential Clipper series? And I was like, it's actually better for the Mavericks if Tim Hardaway Jr. doesn't play that much. <laughs> like that they don't all of a sudden need him and are like, oh, we just desperately need offense. So we're going to throw him out there, right? If the Mavs, if the Mavs are working in the way that they need to be working, it's defense first and then it's Luka and Kyrie creating just enough offense to make it work. And they have because they've created amazing offense. And so, uh, but, it, but it's the defense. Coming up, what more should we know about the Dallas Mavericks against the Los Angeles Clippers? And what more do we need to know about the Clippers? Talk about all that and more coming up. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. You've got that passion. You've got that drive. You've got that patience. You've got that winning formula that wins a championship in the NBA. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle, level it up to peak performance. Check it out. They've got super chat, superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for there. And when you do, you know that guaranteed it's going to fit your car because they have that eBay guaranteed fit. 
to make sure it's going to fit your car the first time or your money back. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusion supply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. The small ball thing is so so interesting because it's been such a staple of what the Clippers have done the last couple of years. And to, to the chagrin of, of Clippers fans, I think, of like being known for that. But uh, for the Mavericks, you've got... Um, You've got you know Gafford at center. They're like they're like a plus six net rating with Gafford at center. At li- with Lively at center for the whole season, they're at plus five and a half. So like pretty good for pretty good with both of them. With Maxi Kleba and PJ Washington at the four and the five. So no other center on the floor. That's kind of their small ball. Even though Maxi is like a six ten, you know, big or whatever. That's sort of their small ball unit. They're a plus nineteen and a half net rating. Like they've outscored teams, and yeah, their schedule was kind of soft to end the season. But there's wins against the the Nuggets in there, the Kings twice, the Warriors twice, like the Heat twice. There, there's a lot of solid wins in there. And this lineup, I think the Mavericks small ball unit is better than the Clippers this season. And I think if it goes down to that, I'm fascinated to see like does that hold up, and does that the way that the numbers look right now, does that hold up in the same way uh, that it has in the regular season? Yeah, it probably is. I will say though. It'll be interesting to see if we see the small ball unit for the Clippers have their best moments in the playoffs. You know, we haven't practiced it too much, but there is a chance. I mean, PJ Tucker and Kawhi have been the people that have been playing the small ball five because our options besides Zubats, they don't have the rim protection. Mason Plumley and Tice. I mean, Tice works hard, but he's six eight. Mason Plumley, for whatever reason, we've got one of those. His name is Dwight Powell. (laughs) <laughs> for whatever yeah exactly but i i yeah i like tice though for whatever i think he should play over mason but the thing mm-hmm. about mason Plumley is he is an absolute free layup for teams it seems like at the rim i don't know what it is but he has poor timing he just he has no rim protection in his game at all at least not this version that we've had on the clippers of mason Plumley. so if zubats does not play heavy minutes or play a good amount the clippers might be in trouble because the small ball fives, as I said, Kawhi and P.J. Tucker. P.J. Tucker has not been a consistent part of the rotation this season. I don't even know if he should play in this series because Dallas, you know, this Dallas Maverick team has been the fastest-paced Dallas team in the Luka era, correct? I mean, I noticed it when yeah. I watched, but yeah, yeah exactly. Sure. So P.J. Tucker, he just adds to our main issue, which is slow and unathletic and old. He's all those yeah, the Mavs pace is, is very interesting this season. It was something that they talked about in training camp that they really wanted to push. They really wanted to, you saw it at the end of last season when when Luca would play, they play the slowest pace in the league. They've been doing it for multiple years, slowest in the league. And it worked well in the playoffs because everything slows down in the playoffs anyway. And so the Mavs were like primed and ready against the Clippers and then against the Jazz and the Suns and the, you know, in the next couple years to slow it down and to to play super hyper efficient in the half court and all that. And the Mavericks can still do that. They're what? Like, I think they're like top five or whatever in half court offense this season. But what they've also done is they've gotten into Luca's head. Hey, let's match some of what Kyrie is bringing to the floor. Because Kyrie, when he came in at the end of last season, he would come on the floor and push the pace and push the pace. And when Luca, then it would be Luca's team and Luca's team would be super slow. And it was like watching two different basketball teams on the same roster and sometimes with the same players. And they're just taking the, the, you know, the cue from their star player. And so, They've kind of molded those and meshed those together where where Luca now is always he gets the ball off of an outlet or gets the ball off of a made basket. He's just always looking up. He's always looking up ahead and he'll throw those hit ahead passes. I mean, first game that they have Gafford, they're playing OKC, really good defensive team, like great defensive team. Luca looks down the court and chucks the ball like in the end zone to, to Gafford with like Jalen Williams on him. And Gafford just goes up and catches it and dunks it. And you go, man, they're like really looking ahead and Luca's really trusting these guys to just catch some of these really tough passes. And uh, I don't think they'll be able to do stuff like that in the playoffs necessarily, but I think they will try and push the pace more. The problem is like if the Mavs try and push the pace, especially with Westbrook, I think you get beat because he's one of the best at that. And the way he pushes the pace for the Clippers has been really effective. But then when you get him stuck in the half court, it's like almost the opposite. It's like when he gets stuck in the half court, it's not as effective as when he's out in transition. We don't get out and run that much since we traded for James Harden. I mean, it really has slowed things down. It's, he does do a, it, yeah. Right. He does do a good job of those hit-ahead passes as well. Uh, James Harden has always been good at that. But for the most part, things slow down. And in the slump that he had, there were possessions where he'd come up the court and he's taking 12 seconds off the shot clock be- you know, before we even get into anything, really. And The other – oh, sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. 
The other part about the Mavs pace is that Kyrie will just like step up and take a, a real quick pull up three in, in like at right. the beginning of the shot clock because somebody just like fell asleep and didn't come up and pick him up. And Luca does the same thing. And like it's not really a fast break possession, but it turned into one because they just caught the team not super prepared to to pick them up at half court. I, mean, I figured one of the reasons why the Mavs pushed the pace is because Kyrie's pull up threat oh. big time. But huge. as far as, as I was thinking about something, though, as you were talking, I do think there is an avenue where the Clippers can actually have a good small ball lineup that they haven't practiced too much. The thing is, my biggest fear with these small ball lineups is having Norman Powell and James Harden on the floor together because mm. they're the two Clippers, the two weakest defenders that the Clippers have in the rotation, James Harden and Norm. And they're in that amazing lineup, you know, our highest net rating lineup. The, the Powell Rangers lineup, as our radio host and his boys on their podcast call it, Norman Powell, James <laughs> The Kawhi. Powell Rangers? Yeah, James Kawhi, That's Paul, amazing. Norman, Zoo. They they light teams up at the end of games because you have you still have the roll threat of Zoo in the screening, and then you have, I mean, James Harden, Norman Powell, Kawhi, and Paul, and that's some amazing offensive firepower right there. Yeah. But if we have Westbrook with Kawhi and Paul and then, like, Amir Coffey and Terrence Mann, I think that wouldn't be too bad. I think that wouldn't be too bad. Or even the James, you asked me about this off camera. What have the Clippers played with the force, you know, big name players much after they've taken Westbrook out of the starting lineup? And yeah. the, the answer they, is that no. Fir that first game against the Mavs this year, they started those guys. And it was a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. They they haven't played them much together, the four of them, but they have figured out that they can be played together, but not usually with the center, not with a non spacer. So maybe you'll see those four plus Norman Powell or those four plus Terrence Mann or Amir Coffey at some point, but it'll be interesting to see if we ever try those four with Zoo. I doubt they do because there's just so much bad data on it. And then I test wise is not good because Harden, when he's in, he has the ball in his hands the most. I mean, he, he averages 19 more touches per game than the next highest guy on the team. I checked that. On he's NBA like tracking. point guard. He'll, t he'll take right. it out from. Yeah. Right. Whereas, and then when you take Westbrook off the ball, as you said, when you're playing a half court game, James Harden running the controls. Westbrook's kind of stashed in the corner. I mean, he's a fantastic cutter, or he's become a yeah. more proactive cutter as a member of the Clippers, but you're just not really maximizing what he does great. So that mixed with Zoo hurts the spacing, and that's why they haven't done it. Yeah, it's an interesting matchup. I'm fascinated to see what happens. I think the other thing about the Mavericks that we haven't really gotten to today is uh, uh, is Dante Exum. He's been amazing. For the, for the Mavericks this season. Just an amazing pickup on a minimum coming over from the Euro League. Before he went over the Euro League, he was not a good three point shooter. This year he shot 50% from three. I mean, and quite literally won multiple games for the Mavericks uh, with just some really clutch shots that if he, he, he isn't there, he hit seven threes against the, the Lakers in one game. He hit the, uh, the, the, the three to tie the game to go into overtime against the Rockets the other day in that comeback win. He's had just some, he was, he scored like 20 points a game when Kyrie was out um, in December when he was out with some injuries. Like Dante Exum has been really good. The Mavericks offense destroys when Dante Exum and Luca and Kyrie, it's like 132 points per hundred possessions when those three are on the court together. It's not a huge sample size, but uh, they've kind of held him back and held his minutes down a little bit, but he's sort of been that X factor. So if there is sort of like the, you know, you talked about Norman Powell being that guy. I think I think probably uh, Dante Exum is that guy for the Mavericks to be that extra ball handler to you know the release valve for Luca or Kyrie, and then to hit some open shots. I mean, just so big. And then his defense has been solid. You saw it in some of those Clippers games too this season uh, that he can kind of he can kind of defend any of those any of the four really. Um, I mean, some more some better than others, <laughs> but but like he can, and that's a that's a huge thing for the Mavericks in their rotation. I see Dante Exum guarding James Harden a good amount in this series. Yeah. But, you know, ultimately for me, James Harden, this is a huge series for him because especially in those starting lineups, the start halves, you do probably have Kyrie Irving guarding you for the most part. And I know Kyrie Irving's been better defensively and luca has been better defensively this year. But the main thing for the Clippers is you got to get those two guys to guard. You got to get yeah, those two guys do. to guard. You got to put them in the action. You got to make them make them work tire them out as best you can. So that's that's my biggest thing as far as offensively. I also want to ask, how's Gafford's rim protection been? Because I see in the games he's he's definitely blocking some shots, but, you know, relative to, I guess, other great rim-protecting centers in the NBA? Yeah, the Mavs' defense is not necessarily trying to funnel 
people to the rim necessarily. And so they're not trying, they're not doing that in the same way that other teams do. Uh, and so he, he's been good though, like at the rim, he's, he, he's so strong at the rim. He's huge, re like rebounding. And that's something that the Mavericks have really struggled with in the past is finishing possessions. I mean, I can pr even think about Clippers possessions like, against the Mavericks where the Clippers got a couple of offensive rebounds in a row because of big wings and big guards. And then you're just like, Oh, over and over the Mavs can't finish these possessions. But with with Gafford, that's not been a problem at all. His rim protection, I think, has been has been solid, and he's just like a deterrent. He'll he'll be, he'll he's the guy that even if he knows it's going to be a goaltend, he'll just he'll just swat it anyway, just to like get it in your head, right? Like, and the Mavericks haven't really had anybody like that in a while. Uh, but yeah, Gafford's rim protection has been solid. But just to have PJ and, and Derek Jones Jr. and the Mavs playing that switching, you know, rotating, like everybody has to stay connected kind of defense has really been the big change for them. Is that um, when Luca and Kyrie are both locked in and they're both trying really hard, they can both be pretty decent defenders. And so if that's the case, then you don't have like such a weak link in, in the five. And that's been the reason why the Mavericks defense has been one of the best in the league the last couple months of the season. It'll be something to watch, but that's it for the first part of the episode. Hope you guys enjoyed. Let us know your series predictions in the comments. And of course, make sure you subscribe to both channels for all things Clippers, Mavs in the playoffs going forward. Any last words for now? See you tomorrow. So much more we could have got into. We will. There's a part two coming out tomorrow with me and Darian Vaziri talking more about the Clippers side of things and how they're different, how they're going to attack the Mavericks and things like that. Great stuff in part two. So come back tomorrow and keep checking back for all kinds of stuff on Lockdown Mavs all throughout the week. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us on Lockdown Mavs. Peace out. Boom.